So I want to share a few things. We're going to go. because 
our county does not have as many students. We have seen a significant decline in the number of students living out in our county. We're very heavy in the city compared to that. We moved the boundaries to 30th Street, just north of McDonald's, to encompass Poppins Park and all that area north to fill Fayette Central. And we were able to do that because we repurposed Maplewood. Now we're to a point where we've lost more students and it's a challenge to fill our schools. And we need to make a decision on how much money we invest in each school. Make sense? I don't know the answer. I don't have a magic eight ball to know what that answer is, but that's our challenge we're facing. We're a countywide district. Some of our kids are on the bus a long time. So what we have to do is how can we provide equal learning opportunities for our kids, K-12, but we're really looking at our elementary kids to make sure that there's a standard set in each classroom. Not that our classrooms are bad. Our classrooms are safe and clean. Just a standard as we move into the next 25 to 30 years in the Bay County School Corporation. What's that standard that we want to set with how the rooms, how the libraries are set up? So that's our challenge. These are the ages of the buildings, and I don't know if you can read those in the back. Little Spartan Preschool Maplewood, originally built in 1963 with additions in 78, 97, 2010, and 2012. Fayette Central, original part of the building in 1930, and then additions in 1990, 92, and 2002. Eastview, built in 1956, and an addition in 1998. Everton is our newest elementary. It's not that new anymore, but it's hard to believe that it's over 40 years old. It was built in 1980, and then there have been two additions to that building in 2011 and 2015. Frazee, which if you look at Frazee and East View, they were pretty much the same book design. Frazee was built in 1959 with additions in 62, 97 and 2010. And then Grandview was built in 1950 with additions in 1969, 1993, 1995, and 2009. Congressville Middle School, which was a high school at one point, was built in 1923. And since then, there have been four additions with the most recent beginning in 2019. And then the high school, which is still called the New High School by some folks. It was built in 1969. Our buildings are all aging. Well cared for, but aging. So that's where we're at. At this point, we don't have any data or information on how much is this going to save us? How much is this going to do here? We're not even at that point. The next community meeting, I would anticipate we would have hard data there. We need to know where we're going first. <coughs> so that's where we're at. And that's why we're here. So what we asked Gibraltar Design to do is let's take a step back, go through the highlights of the information from the facility study. And then after that's done and all the information is presented, we have a microphone here if anyone wants to ask questions, share ideas or comments. We may not be able to answer those, but we will start a document that we will collect those questions and provide answers. So sort of an FAQ that we will keep on our webpage along with this presentation that will be posted tomorrow morning. So all of this information will be on our webpage where we currently have several presentations already there. Did you all hear me in the back gate? So are we good with where we're at? So go into this with a mindset of, there's no plan already in place, I promise. The board does not know what it's going to do yet. They're still forming their opinions and getting the information they need. So this is the next step in it. This is a big deal. So we want to take our time and make sure that we do things responsibly, responsibly 
because our taxpayers pay for our buildings. So, at the end of this, there will be a time for questions. We'll take about a two-minute break, and then if anyone has questions or comments, we'll have that at the end. Good deal? All right, I will turn it over to Jim, and you all can introduce your team. Thanks to Super, thanks to Super, thank you, Collins. Nice to see everyone. We don't need to fill the auditorium, we just need quality people present. And by my look, I think you all seem like very quality and interesting people. We're interested in you a little bit more than that. Could we get a show of hands so that our team can get a sense and not introduce our team? How many of you are currently parents of children in the school district? Next show of hands, staff. Okay. We'll vote. And then anyone here who is just a very interested citizen and just wants to know what's going on with school districts. Um, two or three, it sounds like wonderful. And thank you all for being here. Uh, this is a process and a journey that began over a year ago. My name is Jim Thompson, and I am an architect, resident of Raw Design, school planner for over 30 years quite a long time all over this wonderful great state of ours it is a great state uh, with me is chris kingery our chief determine uh, where they can go should they do it what does this mean for learning everything we think about is about learning and that's why we have someone like chris on our team who has real life experiences and can share those uh, not only with the staff people but also with your school board and your school leadership also a little bit of we probably represent collectively probably 30 people who are looking at your schools, determining solutions and budgeting and preliminary estimates and all of that work that will go into helping your school board and your leadership team determine what should be done, how could it be done, uh, what are some uh, key aspects and outcomes that will happen if we do it. Um, there's probably 70 or more slides in this presentation, I'm not gonna go through every one. We're not gonna be here that long. Uh, Chris will either stand up and yank the microphone from me or do something to tell me to wind it down. Uh, but we will take at the time to explain some of the information so that if you choose to find it online, as Superintendent Khan said, it will be made available. And you could then look at the information in more detail for those of you that might be interested. Um, so with that, let me just check a couple other things for Oh, something else you might be interested in. So, okay, so how do we as school planners and construction people, how do we do this? Well, first of all, 30 to 50 years of experience. There's probably nothing we haven't seen before. We love this auditorium, for example. We've done one of these for Kokomo, where they renovated their auditorium, and we helped them do that. Uh, so we use our experiences, uh, even equipment and cleaver boilers and all the old things that are in schools. When you do it as long as we have, as long as I have, uh, and Tim and others, We've seen just about all of it, so we know from experiences what can be done to update them, which is what we've done for many school districts. So one of our jobs is to bring to your school board, here, how, here is how other districts in the state of Indiana who've had very similar situations, how have they addressed it, and how have they dealt with budgeting and execution and getting that done. Um, and then the third thing is um, itemizing, inventorying, categorizing, uh, using data from the industry about how long boilers, chillers, and these things I'll get into in a little bit, how long they last. Um, a little bit, but those of you that remember the days of textbooks, at some point textbook, textbooks need to, are out of date and they have to be replaced and updated. That's an analogy of what happens with buildings. Uh, you have a great maintenance and facility team, but eventually things are out of date, obsolete, they need to get replaced and updated for the building to continue. No different than replacing textbooks back in the day. So learning can continue. Okay, some observations, just generally speaking, um, for your district. You're not unlike any district, uh, like I said, across the state. Uh, you have similar needs. Um, in certain areas. And while your maintenance staff and facility team does an excellent job maintaining that, at some point, parts are no longer available. If you like old antique cars and you're going to look for something 
you're going into aftermarket, you're hunting through the website. Well, that's not so quick and easy when you have over 200,000 square feet of elementary schools and you're trying to maintain unit ventilators or boilers or things that make that building system work and you're looking for parts that manufacturers choose just not to make, make anymore. Other times things are simply obsolete. They just don't operate in a way that's effective for the school building in today's environment. And that can be due to electrical supply for energy and those types of things. You may not be aware of this, but, um, oops, sorry about that. Um, in Indiana, you have two funds. And I'm not gonna go into a whole explanation about all of the minutia of that, but generally speaking, you have a fund that the legislature just finished talking about and legislating for, which is to have uh, staff operations of a school district. And they fund that with our tax dollars in this state. On this side, if I'm standing over here in the facilities uh, category, the state of Indiana a long time ago decided that local communities shall pay for their own school buildings, bricks and mortar type. If you needed to build a new school, you're paying for it locally. If you need to update a school, you're paying for it locally. And by the way, your school board does an outstanding job with what they've been given. So they are not in control, nor are we in control of the state deciding that's how school communities shall pay for school buildings. You want a roof over a child's head as a school, you're gonna pay for that. If you wanna update it because it's leaking, you need to pay for that. The state doesn't come in and uh, save the day for buildings, bricks and mortar. And your board is very aware of that very forward thinking. Superintendent Collins mentioned the process that's being done is very purposeful, methodical, and deliberate so that all the information can be collected and assimilated. Um, something else that I think um, was mentioned, um, the elementary schools are positioned to be ready to be modernized and updated. So. Uh, that's not the only focus we had of the assessments and the subsequent options and studies that we're going through, but it is definitely a primary focus. Part of that is because if you looked at the building data, and again, not uncommon in a school district, the high school gets addressed periodically because that's where all of your children go collectively, 9 through 12. And then the middle school, uh, maybe there were some people in this room, there was a time when the middle school needed to be addressed, much like the elementaries are approaching, and the decision was made, this is how we're gonna address it. So, in some ways you could almost say it's the elementary school's turn in line to be getting funding to decide what to do. Um, one other thing that I get asked a lot, well, is there any other benefit besides not having to repair and maintain for schools? In today's world, modernizing a school means we can save energy and create better efficiencies. What does that mean? That means that if a building takes less energy to heat because it's been modernized over here with your capital dollars, your, your local community paying for it, when the state gives you money to operate the school, if you can be a school community that saves 25% on energy costs on an annual basis, that's money that goes back into classrooms and staff and salaries and all those things that make up operating. If I just did round numbers, let's say, and I'll just make a number up, we had 200,000 200, square feet of building and we could save just 10 cents a square foot. That becomes a meaningful number when you can do that year after year after year. So energy savings, and it's usually roughly about 25% total if you modernize a complete building. Doing okay. okay. You will see some assessment charts, and this is in the PowerPoint. A black box means it's wearing out, lurking surprise, beyond its useful life. That's at the bottom. At the top, there's an outline box when you see the assessment tables, that means that it's either been already replaced and is like new, 
or it's something that is um, maybe it hasn't been replaced recently, but it has a really uh, substantial, robust life expectancy. So if it was replaced eight or 10 years ago, it's still behaving like it was brand new. And so it doesn't necessarily need attention. Black boxes, on the other hand, if they're a lurking surprise, they're gonna fail beyond their useful life, which means like it's older than the industry would have in a school. Those are gonna need attention. In the middle, the half box, box with a diagonal, that just means it's uh, needing to be looked at, maybe it's not a priority, or maybe it just means um, it's less of a priority than a black box. Okay, we went through, as I mentioned, all types of data, age of schools. We interviewed the maintenance and facility staff to get their input. And so every building, if you look at the columns on the right, Every building and aspect of secondary education buildings were inventoried. On the left is the first column, and it represents by row a system, a component, an aspect of the building. So a system, component, aspect of the building, something that makes the building uh, go from a bricks and mortar, heating, cooling, lighting, um, operational sense in this uh, aspect of what a building needs to operate. And you can see there's black boxes, half boxes, and empty boxes. My sense is that most of you, your eyes will be attracted to the black boxes. That's the whole point of why we set this up, so that all of you can get a sense of, look at all these things that are wearing out beyond their useful life or need attention. Conversely, you have many things that are looking pretty good in the district. So it's a way to very quickly start to understand the very challenging and difficult task ahead for the school board to sort this out and figure out funding and then determine what are the next steps. So we did the secondary schools and then we proceeded with the elementary schools. Just want to make sure I'm, yes. So, one of the things about the elementary schools, very quickly, because some of you might be saying, well, hey, these elementary schools are not all the same. How is that fair? That's just normal, right? If you had a building that was built new, then it's gonna go along its life as a new building starting age. It's no different than having a child that's eight years old and a child that's three years old. They're gonna experience life differently, no different than a building which, by the way, is a living, breathing entity. Buildings breathe, they have air coming in, they have air going out, uh, they have a life. And so um, in these buildings, you can see that they're not all the same in terms of condition, both with the row, and if you looked at each building on the columns, they're different. Why can that happen? Well, um, certain times, something can wear out quicker for a variety of reasons. Other times, a decision could be made, we need to update, fill in the blank, or we need to update a row district-wide, which means every building that's, say, at the elementary level would be updated at the same time in the same year. And so that's why buildings have, like yours do in this district, different evaluations for each uh, aspect. But you can very quickly start to see with the black boxes where you want to pay attention to things and where you might uh, be able to not have to spend money. Online, you can go through if you had a particular building you're interested in, or if you thought, well, this building's particularly old, I wonder what it's like. You can go online and, and look at this data. We use this data with Skilma Corporation to start to formulate how to address those things. And I'll make a couple of comments about that at the very end of this presentation. Okay, picture's worth a thousand words. Or, Mr. Thompson, this is incredible data and my head's already swimming, like how am I supposed to understand this? Um, some people like to have pictures. So just think of the rows of the what, and then let's translate that to a picture. So here's a picture in the lower right. 
of a unit ventilator. Unit ventilator is like, you ever been to those hotels and you're trying to sleep and this thing's going hum, hum, and you're like, man, yeah, I see heads nodding. Okay, that's a unit ventilator basically in a hotel room. They're a little bigger in a classroom. When they get old, you can't find parts and they get noisy. Can you imagine one of the poor children sitting right next to that and they're, they can't hear it. They're like, what's the teacher saying? I can't, because it's noisy it, or it kicks on. You know, it's quiet like your house and all of a sudden you hear the air conditioning kick on. So that's called a unit ventilator. The big picture is an example of what it looks like when it's been replaced and it's new and modern. First of all, they're vertical. Second, they're very well insulated, very quiet. Remember my bullet point, 25% energy savings, so you're gonna reap that. And then you're not gonna have, even though Jimmy and Daryl and other maintenance people are very friendly, you're not gonna have them going into a classroom while you're trying to instruct to figure out how can I get this to work because the kids are too hot because the air conditioning's not working. That's what a unit ventilator does. And then boilers. Um, some of us, like me, Hey, these old boilers in the lower right, those are awesome. They last, they're like a diesel engine that went down the tracks or something. They just seem to last forever, and if you know how to repair them, they're great. However, on the big picture, you can see the new and modern higher efficiency. Heating when, with these old boilers use a lot of energy, and they waste a lot of money. And we want to have modern boilers, like you see in these pictures, to transfer that money into classrooms and not pay our local energy companies. And if there's anyone here that works for a local utility, I apologize, but you get paid for the utilities we use, but we do want to try and save energy and just be good citizens of the planet. And then chillers are the same way. Um, you know, chillers, if they're like this case, you know, they're outside, they can, weather can take uh, an issue on them, and then they just, they just wear out. And so you can see a new modern chiller to help the cooling. One of the things that's interesting in my career over the last 30 years, Victor and some of us old timers, um, used to be like heating, really important. That's sort of taken for granted. Cooling now, everybody wants the cooling to be right and proper and not too humid, because humidity in the shoulder seasons, if you will, of Indiana can get kind of humid. And so chillers and how we cool a building and dehumidify a building to get the humidity out become very important. You, you may be thinking, well, with all this data, uh, I still don't see the connection. I mean, kids learn and, and you have teachers, many of you staff, my compliments, you could probably teach really well in a tent because you're that creative, that capable. But at the end of the day, you wanna try and give your students something better. Make no mistake, heating, cooling, light levels, fresh air, all these different things, they impact the day-to-day -day learning of the children and the ability of the staff to stay focused. I mean, if you're just hot and miserable, it's hard to stay focused. Um, if you're chilly and you're trying to wear a coat because you're trying to teach in a cold room, all those things matter, and we know that. So that's the why, and that's woven into all of this. As much data as we could show you, that's why it matters. Um, I'm gonna go through two buildings. I'll do this high school and show you how we collected, assimilated, formulated that information. And then when we get to the elementary schools, I'm gonna go through uh, Eastview Elementary and we'll kind of go a little deeper into that data so you can see not just how the summary was created, but you can see well, what supported that summary and what information was collected. So online, we have the high school information such as um, when it was originally built, the, if you're not familiar with the campus, Google's a lot of fun. You can see what that looks like. Uh, number of acres, uh, some of the configuration of the building by looking at the rooftops. By the way, if you're really clever, you can use the rooftops and start to figure out, well, that's older than that, which is older than that, and you can start to piece together uh, just visually when, when buildings were built and, and what they were built. It's a, you know, from, Indiana standpoint, it's a fairly large high school, I would say. It's above the 50% average of a high school. Um, over 200,000 square feet is a lot of space to maintain and manage. One of the things that uh, happens at a high school is the, um, again, since you have nine through 12, if something happens that it's affecting cooling or if some piping breaks down for the kitchen, you're on it because you got so many students in one building. 
And so it can be very disruptive if that's not addressed. So many school boards, like your own school board, for example, currently we're working on a chiller to make sure the cooling system is going to maintain itself and continue to work the way we want to for the high school learners. You can imagine the worst would be like no air conditioning on a test day, right? Everybody gets hot, the kids are complaining, and then your, maybe your test scores aren't what you want them to be for the students. All right, so with this assessment, um, what I wanted you to see was how um, the columns, so at the next level of information, what our engineering and expertise does is you see one column that's labeled condition, that's where the boxes are. So that was those ratings I was talking about. Black, bo black boxes, everyone remember? Pay attention to them, surprises beyond their life. Um, clear boxes are things that have either been replaced or are doing just fine. Um, years in service is the next column. That was, uh, to the best of our ability, a way to inventory how old something is, how long it's been functioning. And then you compare that to the right-hand column, which is life expectancy. And it's a rough life expectancy. Some of you may have experiences that say, well, I think that should and could last a lot longer. Um, others would say, there's no way it lasts that long. Um, but generally speaking, it's industry averages. So that helps us with this next piece, which is, um, if I just grabbed a couple, and if you look with me, you can see, so the cooling plant, and I mentioned the school board has elected to replace a piece of equipment, a chiller that does cooling, so that we could update it, but look what a great job your maintenance and facilities team has done, and their stewardship. The chiller that is 25 years old, those normally don't last more than 17 to 20 years. So we've extended five more years of life, but it caught up to itself and now it needs to be replaced. Something else you would see, for example, this is not uncommon. Um, those of you that are in classrooms and experience technologies or even in your own home, you're like, boy, I need some more outlets. I mean, whoever said wireless is without wire, you still need to plug them in and get some power. So it's not uncommon in a school district like this with buildings that were originally built without any idea what was coming down the road in 20 years, 30 years with computers and uh, technologies and video learning where you're projecting on screens in rooms. Um, it's not uncommon to have deficiencies in just basic convenience electrical outlets for uh, laptops and charge carts for iPads and those types of things. So these are two things that stood out when we looked at Connorsville High School. If you did not like to look at boxes and that type of visual, we tried to summarily just create some primary areas of focus in a narrative form. So you could just read some things that are important and caught our attention, which the board now has seen. Um, and then secondary means some things that are still important, but maybe we wouldn't um, immediately uh, address those unless funding became available doesn't mean they're going to go away. It just means maybe you postpone them. OK. Um, at the high school, we didn't forget about the pool. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about pools, um, boy, they can be a lot of maintenance. You have a big investment. But Indiana has lots of lakes and rivers. And um, every now and then, you'll see or read in the news, maybe not in Indiana, but you'll read about somebody who drowned, who was an adult. And some of us might think, well, doesn't everybody learn how to swim? How many of you, I had to learn to swim when I went through school. It was required of my PE class. Did anybody else have to have required? Yeah. Well, you have to have something that's safe and capable of allowing for pool instruction. Then the other thing we know is that swimming is a great life fitness exercise. Anybody else swim for exercise? It's a great way to have that life fitness and, and healthy lifestyle. And so um, you have students who want that opportunity, who um, benefit from that opportunity to be on a team, swim, compete. Uh, the other nice thing about swimming, right, it's an individual sport, but a team sport as well. So you kind of learn that ability to, as a student, you learn the skill of delayed 
uh, incremental improvement, how to work hard and just improve by a few seconds for your swimming. So lots of reasons why we want to pay attention to a pool and not forget about it. Um, and then we looked at other buildings in the district. So we're going to move now to, um, we'll just, I'll have Chris, we'll just kind of click through these slides and you can just see that other information is there across the other buildings and then we'll hit pause when we get to the elementary school uh, lead-in slide. Okay, elementary schools, in summary. Um, over 200,000 square feet. Uh, I thought Superintendent Collins did a nice job talking about very important other aspects of elementary schools that when you have many, um, over maybe one of the largest geographic square mile areas in the Erie County School District, um, there are factors such as transportation. Uh, there are also factors such as each school uh, or several of the schools can have different ways in which they get utilities, the way they would handle sanitary sewer, um, even perhaps what kind of utilities are available, which can affect efficiencies if it's all electric versus having natural gas available. So. Um, much like you saw on the assessments, and if you remember in the very beginning, I showed you an assessment where you can align each of the elementaries and then see what kinds of needs there are for the facilities. Um, that's what we did. Um, as I mentioned on the high school, we collected the square footage data, acreage, other basic aspects of the elementaries. Uh, the term I use for the school board and for many of you that are going to uh, take a look at this after. It's a way to get your arms wrapped around that. You know, like, well, I don't need to know every detail. That's why we have facility staff. But you maybe want to get your arms wrapped around the sense of which schools to you appear to need more help, which ones seem to be doing fine. Um, the other thing about these assessments, point to make, um, many people will say, well, you know, it's carpet and paint, and there's lights in the building. That seems fine. These assessments show you there is so much hidden inside a building. And if you're like the Skillman and Gibraltar team, or Jimmy or Daryl, you kind of like that, right? It's what you do, it's your passion. Like, uh, you don't mind crawling in a tunnel to see what's in there that needs help to get work done, or looking above ceilings, or climbing on a roof. So, all those different things. So, just to help uh, if it is. Um, I think it's worth stating. It's not just walking in, looking around, saying, well, everything looks fine, and then turning around and leaving. There's so much hidden. And if you just, um, if you've ever torn apart an old house and seen, for example, galvanized pipe for plumbing, the steel pipes instead of copper, you're like, huh. So in the evolution of construction and buildings, different materials were used at different times. And you have building materials in these buildings that one of the reasons they're out of date and wearing out is uh, 40, 50 years is a pretty long time to be using piping and some of those things. So that's hidden things that we don't see. Sometimes it adds up to a lot of money. So what people say is, oh my gosh, I can't believe there's that much need and it costs that much money when I can't see any of it. So uh, I think that was worth showing as we go through each elementary school. Um, you have some nice things that you have done, like Little Spartans. And um, that gives you maybe some sense of how dollars can be invested for a big gain, meaning your Little Spartans can have the advantage of a new, fresh, updated learning environment. We're going to stop on the Eastview School. So, um, a couple other things I think that 
would be important to note. Um, uh, while age is important, age of the school, equipment being worn out, something else that we notice as school planners, and some of you as staff notice, um, different eras, what we did in the 50s for a school is different than what we did in the 60s for a school, in the 70s, I see some heads nodding, and then what we did in the 80s, and now what we do 40 years later in the 2020s. How many of you remember open concept? Anybody ever had that? Crazy, right? Good idea at the time, maybe? But that's just one vivid example of how things change in education. Now, I've been around some educators who have done this for 40 years, and they'll say, well, if you wait long enough, it'll circle back around. Fortunately, I haven't heard open concept come back, because that was crazy. <laughs> but at any rate, um, that's something else that, so, so what I'm trying to emphasize is the size of a classroom, for example. At one point, we thought 700 square feet with, with time length, you know, the, the room 700 square feet. Then we thought maybe 850 square feet. Current thinking is now 950 square feet. So that's 50% bigger again. And so that, a, a building's ability to leap forward if modernized with walls and the configuration to be um, effective also is something that the school board will need to weigh in on um, in terms of uh, what I really liked was the way it was said, um, what's the standard, uh, what's the benchmark, what does this school district want as a standard for classroom, a standard for a gym. And so the building's time that it was built will, will play into that evaluation criteria. And we do, we do that, uh, we're in the midst of doing that, and it's a future option consideration. So if we do this, and we want to fix the gym or the classroom size, the solution looks like this. Sometimes we call those solutions feasibility studies. So we have feasibility study option one. So that's just something else that's not readily apparent. What you're seeing tonight is just the matter of fact, facts of age and is it worn out? How many years life does it have left? What's coming is how do we put that into a formula that says here's how we can modernize and do the other things that go with the school. I already mentioned how each school is, at an elementary level, can be different, and why the time that it was built or a particular need was triggered and it was addressed, so that's why they're different. But you can see at the elementary level, um, same, same evaluation is available and it was done for the age of the equipment. Far right column tells you the industry average, and then that tells you is it coming up on its end of life? Is it still gonna have plenty of years left? And that's how we can then create the boxes of being black box needing attention, or a clear box, it seems like it's gonna be fine for a few years, or then half boxes. And then, again, a couple of components to draw out your attention. Um, one thing about plumbing fixtures, by the way, and, um, I've seen it both ways. If, you know, uh, porcelain china, the fixtures, sinks, white porcelain, the toilets. China, if well maintained, it lasts a long time. It's normally the chrome fixtures, the flush valves, the sink faucets and things that get to be more problematic. However, at some point, even china is staining and looks inappropriate. I did hear a great comment. Um, I haven't given it much thought, but I just popped in my head. How we think of our students is often reflected in the condition and what we do to our restrooms. Meaning, if you think of the restrooms as needing to be forticated like a prison, it means you kind of expect the students to behave that way. If you have nice restrooms and clean and updated and refreshed, you tend to express to the students, hey, let's make this nice for you. It's just uh, an educator shared that with me, and some of you may say, yeah, that's kind of true. Like, when the students go into a messy, old, dirty restroom that, not about maintenance, it's just, it's so old, it just cannot be sustained. 
it's a reflection to the students like, hey, we're not gonna fix this. So anyway, just how we, how we do our restrooms, how we think about our kids. Next, um, again, in narrative form. Some of the elementary schools, keep in mind this is partial listing because some of the elementary schools, if I put it into word format narrative like this, I'd probably need a couple eight by 11 pages. So this is a very high level partial listing of things that caught our attention, both very important items in the primary and then under the heading of secondary things that we think are still wanting to be addressed, maybe not quite as a priority. Um, how we go into those and how much money it costs, that's all part of the future evaluation. So I'll have Chris kind of go forward and we'll create a summation for this evening and open it up for questions and conversation. Okay. Yeah, we're doing, doing it very informative. So, um, first of all, just to reemphasize, I'm a big believer that you know we shape our environments, and then our environments shape us. It's the same with schools. Um, you can talk about it in terms of positive attitude, smiles, uh, cheerfulness, joy of learning. And those types of things, which mean a lot to the culture of a school and how students who come into the building each day are ready to learn and going to enjoy their day of learning, even though you know some of them come with pretty tough things that may have happened to them when they arrive. It's no different with the living, breathing building. Um, and I'm a big believer that when we shape our buildings and create them right-sized and they have arrangements that work for the right type of learning and instruction, um, Comfort, if the too hot, too cold in the rooms, I think there becomes a level where that becomes very difficult. Teachers are very resilient and incredibly capable. My compliments to all of you. So sometimes, though, it might be, I had a very first chairman of the board, H. Dean Evans, used to call them uh, splinters under the fingernails, like just this nagging thing that eventually, if you don't pull that splinter out, it starts to infect the hand and then the arm, and it starts to deteriorate the other things that this community wants learning to be for our children because the rooms are too hot or the unit ventilators I showed you are too noisy. And there's a half a dozen kids in the building that sit close to them and it's too noisy for them and that's just not fair to them. So it's a hard effort. And while we accumulate all this, my, again, my compliments, you have a very conscientious school board that's doing this in a purposeful way a methodical way, a prudent way, a way to be good stewards, and obviously a way to figure out the tough task of finances and funding because the state says it's going to be handled locally. So what's affordable, right? How much can we do? Um, not uncommon, 15 years. Um, I mentioned how the high school gets updates. Um, there are certain things that the board's been made aware of at certain schools with heating and cooling. Again, those types of things tend to be alerts because they're primary. It's like the engine itself in the car. Um, new technologies, electrical systems, I mentioned plumbing fixtures. Um, I get asked this question, so I thought I'd just bullet point it for you because your district applies to this fact. So while something does not meet current building code, the buildings are safe from a standpoint of like fire safety and egress. Uh, and first of all, compliments to school building principals and leaders who make sure your fire drills are working, staff is alert, you account for the children, you get them out of the building safely. So buildings, even though it's not a current code that it's being met by the building, they're still safe. And I think that's very important to note. And your district is very attentive with its maintenance staff, facility staff, school leadership, and school board to make sure buildings are safe. But if we were to build a building new, there are things we would do to the building that aren't done right now in your current buildings. 
Second, just a comment about handicapped accessibility. We get this question a lot. It's also true that if we built a new building, there would be a handicapped accessibility building codes in the state of Indiana that we would follow for handicapped accessibility. However, the state of Indiana very wisely, when it passes legislation to update handicapped accessibility requirements, gives local school districts, and not just school districts, but anybody that runs a public building like a city, a town, um, a library, um, it gives quite a bit of latitude for the local community who has to pay for these changes, because again, the state uh, unfunded mandates, is that what we love to say, school leaders, aren't those fun? So when the state says a restroom has to be handicapped accessible, they give quite a bit of leeway to a school district to say, how are we going to meet that accessibility need? Which can mean um, simply having a different restroom in the building to meet that handicapped accessibility need, or addressing it over time so uh, your buildings meet a standard of care, but there would be reasons why if we're going to invest significantly in a building, we would go in and update as practically as possible these building code and handicapped accessibility needs. But we, you aren't required to and you do not need to make the building as if it were built like new in 2023 or 2024. So there are still some walls and doors and things that you wouldn't want to invest money on because you want to spend it all in the more important things. Um, and then I've mentioned several times the impact that learning environments have. So as we transfer this information, uh, again, available online, so if we know what we have and we want to just start to look forward to what would we do about this, um, these next two slides, both of them, start to take the same tabulation of black boxes and what's good and what's not good, and it translates it to check marks to say, for this boiler situation, here are the schools or the buildings that are going to want to be addressed eventually. So think of the check marks as like action. What are we going to start doing about this? Well, we're going to first start looking where there are things to be addressed by building and by system. So some things you can see are all the way across the district. So one approach could be, why don't we just fix that row? Let's just fix everything across all the buildings. Or another approach would be categorically look at the vertical columns and say, why don't we just fix one school because it has a whole bunch of checks in that column. God bless our school board as they get to assimilate and look at that in both directions and try and arrive at what is the best means by which to go forward? Aligning budgets, needs, and assessments. But in a very transparent way, uh, Gibraltar, Skillman, your school board, your school leadership wants to make sure you all can see this information, not in a way that's meant to be confusing or hide things, it's just very open. These are just check marks saying these will want to be addressed. Or conscientiously, you can say, Way to go, maintenance and facility staff. Give us five more years. Not right now. We're not going to do it right now. But you can still see it's there. So that future boards can know that it might be a need. So, or needs can go away because of reasons like, and I'll just be sort of silly about it. Let's just say, well, we're just not going to do science anymore in the high school. Well, then why would you update science rooms, right? So some things can go away. And, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but there are reasons why you wouldn't spend money on something because you can foresee with a reasonable amount of study that we could spend money right now, but in two or three years or five years, we might not want to spend that money because it's gonna change. And you'll have wished five years from now because money doesn't replenish itself. I don't know a district in the state that just year after year after year can be pouring money into school buildings. You get certain chances, certain opportunities and time to do it right, and that's why your board's taking its time, being very purposeful. Professionals like Gibraltar and Skillman, we assimilate the information, the costs, share experiences, say here's different ways to look at it. Um, we don't control the cost, we don't dictate the cost. Any contractors in the room? Anybody that does construction? Yep, that's a hard business right now, isn't it, with market industry and prices changes and all those crazy things. So 
contractors, when, when something is decided, we do these drawings, Skillman helps us bid and get contractors involved, and then they can be executed, but the market dictate, dictates uh, those pricings and so forth. So, what's next? Um, there are things, uh, practical things. We need to summarize the information in a couple of different more ways. We need to create some options on how to address the needs. Um, we need to create budget estimates, which are underway. Uh, at some point, there's a, a balance or an alignment, if you will, that says we can get this much done at these schools for this much money. I call that alignment. You can figure out, I see heads nodding. So uh, much like at home, well, I want to build a deck. How much can I afford? So how big and nice can my deck be? So that's kind of what you're thinking about. And then um, we call it for our work as school planners and architects, feasibility options with the Skillman Corporation and construction uh, management side. Um, what are those options? And we, we say that because feasibility means everything's on the table to be discussed. As Superintendent Collins said, nothing's been decided. So you get all the ideas out on the table, and then little by little, one by one, you start to say, well, that's not feasible because fill in the blank, too much money. Or that's not feasible because we can't disrupt education to get it built. Because, by the way, in today's environment, Skillman would say, you can do just about anything you have enough money and enough time, but you do have to think practically because you're a school district and at least for most months of the year, the business of educating children doesn't stop for construction. And that'll be relevant when you're working with existing schools, which is why you have a partner such as Skillman who has excellent experience taking care of the construction phase. So um, let's not get the cart ahead of the horse though, we gotta figure out what, what needs to be done. Also, I hope some or all of you at the appropriate times will come back for another community meeting that can involve some of these additional questions you have, like when will we know how much it will cost and what are the options that the board's seriously considering? Uh, not all the options and stuff, but what are, and then what kind of input would the community have? So maybe in a different forum than this, we're gonna open it up for questions. I see microphones. Um, but maybe in a different format, we would present some ideas that you could react to. Thank you all again. You are a terrific community. For the past year, we've really enjoyed coming here. A lot of neat history in Connersville. Um, things are changing. Um, but you are a great Indiana community, and we're going to continue to work hard for you, Skillman and Gibraltar. And I know your school board and school administrative team also work very hard for you. That's very evident. So. We appreciate this first opportunity and look forward to the next. Thank you. He's much more adept with microphones than me. So I know that's hard to read in the back. So we will have this information on the website tomorrow on the Fayette County School Corporation webpage. And then we're going to also start gathering questions, answers. This is still preliminary, I mean, we're, the board is still taking all this information in, so keep that in mind. But we did want to offer a forum here if someone had some questions. If we can't answer them, we will get that information out on the website as we collect that information. So would anyone like to come forward and ask anything or share anything? Please feel free. I'm going to give you this mic too. I That one works, okay. Okay. Hey guys, I'm Audra McGuire. I'm a parent in the Grandview School District. Got a, a few notes I made during the meeting. Um, you opened the meeting about antique cars. The cool thing about cars, they can be modified. Did you know that you can actually take a new Honda engine, put it in an 89 CRX, and it will pull tens down the drag strip? You might have to move a few engine mounts, but I have a feeling that our families would be okay moving mounts over junking that whole 89 CRX. And Mr. Collins, you opened the presentation talking about declining numbers to the school board. Don't confuse declining total numbers over the numbers in the school system in the classrooms. My beautiful 10-year-old daughter is a COVID kid. And the reason I can say that she's gonna be a fifth grader 
is because her third grade teacher is sitting right back there. Those kids learn differently. They adapt differently. And these teachers have had to adapt like crazy to get my smart child to the fourth grade and now to the fifth. Right now, kids at Grandview, they get 15 minutes for lunch. And that's not a knock on my school. That's simply because they don't want kids eating at 9 a.m. And I'm lucky to be in a school where I know my kids are cared for. Right now, in the Grandview District, we have neighbors, neighborhoods in the walker zone that have kids that have to walk almost a mile to school. With poverty, lack of household transportation, parent work schedules, and other factors, we have kids in grade schools walking roughly 20 minutes to school. Now we know in the winter, that's gonna be in the dark and in the cold. And I can give you examples if you need them. If our schools are closed, are there plans to increase the buses and shrink the walker zones? We do not want our children walking to school at 7.30 in the morning on crowded streets. I know our, kid, our schools need work, and you guys have a really hard job ahead of you, but I ask you to take into consideration our entire community and just think, is putting a kid on a bus at five o'clock in the morning that woke up at 4.30 and that's probably hungry a better option than having a cool STEM classroom, and that's not a knock on STEM because I want STEM there too but we can't send kids in the Everton area into the city. Those kids are already getting up early enough and we can't send the kids from Bentonville somewhere else. They're already getting up early enough. Thank you. This isn't really reflected on the buildings, it's um, reflected on the students that have left the district. Um, I've only lived in Connorsville for five years and I know numerous kids that go to different st districts that still live within Connorsville. Have we ever asked as a board member, as administration, ask these families why they're choosing to drive their children to other school districts instead of staying in their community? I mean, that's, I know that's not the only numbers that we're missing and we're trying to say that it's another community that's moved into our um, county, but we have lost a lot of students. And I believe that if the rural schools in this county are closed, it'll be no, we will lose a lot more students to other school districts because we're gonna be driving them anyway because nobody's gonna wanna put their kids on a bus that early in the morning. And that's where I stand with it. Thank you. Hi. So a lot of you already know me, but um, I have a lot of things to say. Because we talked a lot about things here today that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense when I look back at our past decisions. Because this board decided to remodel Everton's gym just finished last year, and now we're talking about closing the school. That's not very forward thinking in my opinion. I don't think about putting a new um, roof on my shed that's debilitating beneath me a year before I decide to tear it down. That's not fiscally responsible. So that kind of brings me to the mentality. I am, I do a lot of construction. That is what I do as a trade. I'm an estimator. And I also know that there's a lot of things that are, are hidden and I'm not, I'm not ignorant to that. I understand that. But I have a really hard time with the mentality of build and tear down in 20 years. You know, when we're looking at buildings that we're putting millions of dollars in and then we're saying, oh, this building is 25 years old, it needs a massive update. Every one of our schools have been updated, it looked like. I mean, we went through them really quickly, but within the last 25 years, our schools have been updated. 
why are they in such a debilitating state now that we're talking about having to close our schools? It makes no sense. My children are bused from a rural part of Fayette County. They get on the bus at, this is the latest year that they've ever, and my kids have been in Everton School for 10 years, and actually 11. Um, this is the earliest or the, the, actually the latest that my kids have ever gotten on the bus, and that's at 7 a.m. And they're arriving, I have one in each one of the schools. I have one here in middle school, one in high school, and one at Everton. And they're, the ones here and at the high school are on the bus for at least well over an hour, Some at times close to an hour and a half. I'm not, I could drive my child to Indianapolis schools in that amount of time that they're on that bus. Now, I'm not saying that to knock anybody, because I understand we're a rural community and it takes time. And there's a lot, of, a lot of stops. But at the same time, it's something that, you know, we're looking at busing kids into town. I, we need to look at why are our kids, like she said, why are us parents deciding to move our kids out of this district? Why are we, we have a, an enormously large amount of people homeschooling their kids, why? What is it happening in our schools that's causing parents to say, ah, I ain't sending mine anymore. He talked about the um, air ventilators and how much of a distraction that is in our classrooms that a child would have to listen to a constant humming. But I want to ask you, <laughs> How much of a distraction is it when you have to pick up kids and move an entire classroom out of a class and into the hallway or into the library or into the gym or into the cafeteria because you have one who's throwing things, throwing scissors, throwing their, their chairs. These are situations that are beyond our building and no amount of, of paint and no amount of new buildings is going to fix that. This middle school has bathrooms that have not been able to be utilized because they shut them down students. Why? Because the students were vandalizing them. Why? I mean, what's happening? <laughs> we're talking about new porcelain sinks, but our kids are tearing down the, the, the stuff. What is happening in our schools that these things are happening? And what kind of a learning environment is that? So this meeting here today doesn't want to address any of that, and I understand why. But I also want to say, hey, why are we doing this? You have no, you're asking us to give opinions on things we don't even have any information. You're asking for a public forum on, on things that you've given us literally no information about whatsoever. The slides that you showed, they addressed Eastview. We're talking about closing down Fayette Central and Everton. And when we look at, I know I've talked to a whole lot of parents. I mean, I talk to a lot of parents. And I can tell you, and you don't have to believe me, but I can tell you that 98% of the parents that I've talked to, when I say, are you going to the meeting? They say, they're going to do what they want to do anyway. It does, our voices aren't mattering. We didn't want Alquina shut down. We didn't want Orange shut down. But you, the board shut them down anyway. And now we're talking about moving our kids <laughs> and it being a problem that we're having to bust them all the way around. When that was literally a decision that the board made, what, 10, 12 years ago. It's not being forward thinking at all. And what is the standard that we're looking at for our classrooms? We talked a lot about a standard and, and it being universal all the way around, but what is that standard? We haven't gotten that answer today. I mean, I don't have it even an inkling of what that would be. So you talked about our elementary schools being a priority, but we've, we only saw one very quickly <laughs> on the slideshow, but we talked about our high school, talked about our sports. I mean, that was a lot of what was on the screen is our soccer complex, our football field, our this and our that. I never saw a science lab on there. I never saw a theater, anything with to do with our theater. We have some wonderful, talented kids that aren't sports, but they're not, they're not, they're being overlooked. There's nothing on there about any of that. 
I would also like to know what exactly you guys might be able to offer this information. Um, what part is it that's been so obsolete that you can no longer find a part for? Is there a particular school or a particular part that you can give me that is currently obsolete and would absolutely be needed to repair a part of our school? We were offered a summary of Eastview, but it never mentioned the fact that Everton has had a new roof, a new gym. We've had a new playground. Well, my kids are there. New playground equipment. Um, I believe we've had air conditioning units. I mean, we've done a lot of upgrading at Everton in the last 10 to 11 years that I remember, and but we're shutting it down. <laughs> When you look at the numbers, you guys do the numbers for me, um, how many parents are saying, hey, I want to transfer my kid to um, Grandview? They go to Everton, but that's their district, but we want, to, we want to take them to Grandview, or we want to take them to Frazee or Eastview. Very few. I would venture to say, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I would venture to say that 75% of the kids that are being transferred are being transferred to our country schools not from them. You talked about Offutt's Park being sent out to um, Fayette Central. I wonder about that decision. Was that a decision that was made because you didn't have room for them in the city schools? So we had to, we can't accommodate them at Grandview, so we're gonna move that, this whole area out here where we can accommodate them. And if that's the case, then why are we closing the school that is filling a need that we couldn't accommodate in town? It just doesn't make sense. I love our schools. I love our kids. Um, anybody who knows me knows that I am all about the kids. And it doesn't have to be mine. If your kid is in my presence, I am going to ensure their safety the best that I can. And I want our kids to be safe at school. That includes being in a safe environment. I want them to be in a very productive environment, a good learning environment. But we don't have that. So all of this is, seems almost to me as a, a fake it till you make it mentality. If we have the pretty lights and we have the nice pretty paint and we have the nice pretty porcelain things in there, then on the surface it looks good. But when you get down beneath it, our kids are not learning, and they don't have productive learning environments. And that is why people are leaving the district. It has nothing to do with our buildings. And if we fix that problem, you'll have people coming back to Fayette County. Because you'll have your homeschoolers coming back. That's what needs to be fixed. Our buildings, yes, they need work, but they do not need to be shut down. They need to be fixed. They need to be maintained. And we need to focus on our kids and their learning and not so much the building that they're standing in. Thank you. Hi there. Um, Thank you so much, Jim and team, um, for your presentation. My name is Alexandra, and I am a mother of a child at Fayette Central. I also attended Fayette Central for nine years, which seems like a lot, but I was one of the first classes of Head Start when it was there two years, um, and then K through six. Uh, so of course, I know it's the best school. Sorry, you have to say that. Um, <laughs> and of course, I have a lot of care um, for that place. Um, I did review all of these slides, not this specific slideshow, but the ones that were made available. Um, so I had already, was already familiar with this information. Um, I think I was expecting to see more of those dollar figures that you had mentioned. So uh, my question is probably a little bit ahead of where we are. Um, but I would say um, thank you for mentioning that you'd like to hold another community meeting when you do have some more um, numbers available. I would appreciate seeing more financial information such as the revenue per elementary school versus the expenditures. Essentially, what does it cost 
per elementary school um, to keep up um, all those expenses versus how much is allocated toward those schools. Essentially, if you're able to provide that information outside of the fixes, right? So if you take out the needed upgrades, can you provide that information to us? So we can see what's the financial sustainability per elementary school. And I'm not exactly sure how those funds are allocated, so um, I think I could understand it if it was provided to me, but I would just like to see what that sustainability is on a normal sort of, we need no fixes kind of manner. I also recognize that might have to be estimated in future years as you project out, as you're mentioning, the, the loss of some of the students in the school district. Um, also, um, and I assume this is part of what you're planning to do, but um, I would love to see dollar figures associated with those check boxes and check marks. Um, I think that it was very helpful to have that visual aid, um, but a check mark at one elementary school for electrical could cost 10% of a check mark at the other elementary school for electrical. And so it's really hard for me to have an idea of what the needs are if the sort of the dollars are sort of missed. And I recognize from what you're saying that um, you're not quite there yet. So I definitely appreciate that. Um, but I would love to request seeing more of that discrete information. The question I had written before, <laughs> before this uh, was done, so it, recognizing this might be a little bit ahead of time, um, but because previous presentations have discussed, I believe, five potential general options for the elementary school plan, which does include a potential of you know, losing one or two schools, um, which I understand to be generally considered the, the county schools, though I'm not sure if that came from you all or if it's just something that was being shared. Um, but given that, that those seem to be at least possibilities that you're going to plan out um, and consider. Um, the idea of closing at least one school. Um, I wanted to say that just a little over a week ago, the governor signed a new two-year budget, 47% of which was allocated toward K-12 through education. Within the budget were significant increases to funding for charter schools, such as an increase in the amounts that these schools can receive per student, now up to $1,400. Um, as well as $25 million allocated for brick and mortar capital grants for charter schools. In light of this, what conversations has the board had regarding the state law which requires school corporations to offer a school building previously used for classroom instruction to charter schools for sale for a dollar or lease for a dollar per year? Put more simply, has there been conversation around the very real possibility of a charter school coming in utilizing this law and the new increased state funding to obtain a closed elementary school to establish a new charter, thereby taking more students from the public school corporation. Thank you. Is there anyone else? There's a lot of statements here. <clears throat> I first want to say no school is closing at this point. Um, with Gibraltar, what they did is similar to what they've done in other communities, they look at options. So those were different options that they presented to the board with different configurations of schools. There have also been questions about what if we move sixth grade to the middle school? I, I was just asked that last week. Our middle school is at 500 kids. We could probably about fit sixth grade in. That compounds our issue though, because when we talk about the costs, I'm gonna give you a few numbers here because it's not all about dollars and cents. What you said, safety, education, that's important. We do have a lot of parents who choose other alternative forms. Some, you know, we look at our kids, we figure out why are they going to other communities. A lot of them are job-based where parents may work in that community. We also receive a lot of kids from other counties where their parents work here. So it's, it's almost a wash with that, but at the same time, how do we get our kids back? That's a really good question. And that's important because we want every Fayette County school child to be here if at all possible. So I think that's a great question. When you go back to look at 
Alquine and Orange. I was a principal at Alquine and Orange. I love those schools. How would we maintain financially if we were still operating eight elementaries today, including Maplewood? I don't know where the kids would come from to fill Orange and Alquina. That's, that's the reality of, of declining enrollment communities, which is most of Indiana, when you look at the rural parts of Indiana. People are moving to the donut counties of Indianapolis, the larger cities. Those schools are getting a lot more funds. The property tax base grows incredibly. I was in Avon for nine years. Go look at their buildings. Go look at what their resources are, their tax base. We aren't seeing the same thing here. And how many of you had your property taxes go up? Mine went up considerably. We are also taking a hit of about 2.4, 2.5 million a year on property tax caps, which that's a great thing when 1% of your residential value is what you would pay in taxes. That's a great thing for us as homeowners, but that's money that we don't receive for our schools. And then when you factor in about $8,000 per student through the tuition, this, that comes from our sales tax, uh, our income tax, that's collected at the state level, which you were referencing. The state did increase our funding, but there's a disproportionate amount that's being funneled back to vouchers. And then the other piece of that, if you follow the news, is the state gave us new money, but now we're paying textbook fees out of that as well. So when they give us new money and our teachers, we think, okay, we're going to be able to continue pushing our, our staff pay. We're now having to pay for all those other pieces that the state didn't give us really new money for. It's still the money that we were designating originally for teacher salary and benefits and employee salary and benefits. So it, it puts us in a tough spot. We had a meeting today with superintendents talking about that. Um, so the new funding is good. But then when you think about $8,000 per child, which is what we need to, you know, we, we have two funds that Jim talked about, the education fund, which is designated for school operations staff. Staffing takes up about 85% of our costs, 85 to 90%. Health insurance is not cheap, and I think we offer very good benefits for our staff. So we want to remain competitive, and that's a priority of this board and for us is to remain competitive in the region, and we are, because we want to attract the best teachers and retain them. So the challenge for us is when Alquine and Orange closed in 2010-11, we had 22.5 kids per class across the district on average. Now, I know there were classes with 14 and 15 and classes with 27 and 28, but when you take the number of teachers, divide it into the students, does that make sense, 22 and a half kids Per class. We're now at 21 students per class in our elementaries. So we're very competitive with that, but yet we still have some outliers where we may have 27 or 28 kids in a class, and then we have 15 in a class in another school. So as we continue to see declining enrollment, and while, yes, we lose some kids for various reasons, we continue to lose our population. People are moving to the larger cities or the areas where there are jobs. Newcastle's going through the same thing, Richmond, Anderson, Muncie, Franklin County, all the surrounding counties, we're all experiencing it and it's tough. So what is, as we look ahead, because I appreciate what you said about for, you know, the foresight, we don't want to waste money, we also don't want to put three or four million dollars into a school and then five years down the road say, we can't sustain this school. And that's the real challenge that's facing us and the board, is what do we do with that? So when Alquine and Orange closed in 2010-11, we had 93 elementary teachers in the district. That's K-6, it does not include special education, art, music, PE, that is just your K-6 classroom teacher, okay? We have 72 teachers today. 21 teachers have been eliminated, those spots, through attrition. We never riffed or fired anyone for, you know, with that. And that's been a really good thing over the history of our schools. But at the same time, we've reduced 21 teachers. But yet our population continues to decrease. So we get into the inequities. And when I was a principal at Alquine and Orange, we had less than 10 kids in some grade levels. 
And then Frazee may have 27 kids in that same grade level. And so then the parents of the kids with 27 were saying, well, why is it okay for Orange to have 10 kids in a class? Those are the challenges, I just want you to understand, those are the challenges we face when we try to look at equity, is if we continue to lose 50 kids a year in the district, how do we sustain those buildings financially? Because we have to have the funds to be able to pay our staff, to be able to pay our utilities. This is one step. If we can reduce our utility costs by 25%, that's a really a positive thing. The solar field, if you've gone out to the high school, look at that. That's a savings every year, guaranteed savings project that we are seeing millions of dollars over the course of 30 years. That was one step. Moving to LED lighting, if you've done that in your own home, you've saved tremendous dollars. But we have to retrofit everything to do that. So when we talk about the classroom standards, it goes into the lighting, it goes into cabinetry and furniture, all those pieces. The air conditioning, heating units are one piece. We could survive this and the board could say, we're not going to do anything, right? We could do that short term. Long term, we can't do that. We've been fiscally responsible. We have a cash balance that we can operate for a while. But we've also committed over $2 million of new dollars to employee raises and benefits over the last few years, last two years. That's $2 million new dollars every year that we're now paying that we weren't paying two years ago for salary and benefits for our staff. And that's a good thing because we need to continue to find ways. Our teachers aren't paid enough and as a whole in, in this nation. Teaching is not valued enough. And that's a shame. But our board has been committed to giving some substantial raises and I hope we can continue that for years to come. So, you know, if we continue to maintain what we're doing, just like now, imagine if we still had 93 teachers at $75,000 a teacher when you figure in pay and benefits for a newer teacher, do the math on that. So we have to continue to find ways to be fiscally responsible and to make those gradual cuts along the way. Hopefully we'll level off, but at this point we haven't been able to do that. So the facilities are just one part of that. And the dollars we use for facilities can't be used on salaries and benefits. It's a totally different pot of money. So as we look at keeping our debt level, this middle school will be paid off here in about three years. It's been the gift that keeps on giving because we've been paying on it a long time. And that decision was made by a board 20 plus years ago to do that. And it was a, it was a good decision. We've really gotten a lot of life out of a great building with good bones. So now our, our next step is knowing that we have debt rolling off because we've been good stewards, sort of like your mortgage. We want to keep our debt level. We don't want to pay everything off and be done because the tax dollars are there in our property taxes. And so our goal as good stewards of, of the taxpayer dollars would be to keep our debt level. And that's what our goal is as we look at this opportunity to take out a bond that we would pay off over a period of time that would keep that debt level, but also do necessary work on our buildings. So I just want to be sure everybody's clear, that's separate money from what we pay our staff and what we get from the state for our tuition. So local property taxes takes care of our buildings, our buses, the bricks and mortar, and then the education fund, which comes from all the proceeds from the state taxes. That's what pays the majority of our costs in our district. So that's what's based on how many kids attend our schools. Make sense? So that's where we're at with the whole funding piece and what do we do? I don't have the answer. I don't want to see any school close and I, I know the board members don't. So we kick this down the road five years. What do we do in five years if we continue to lose students? That's the same thing that's facing superintendents and boards all over the state. And our rate of decline is, gone, is less than a lot of districts around us. Rush County, Franklin County, Newcastle, 
Richmond, they're seeing a greater loss of students at a faster pace. So we've been fortunate with that. So I just want to add that you had a comment. So if we talked about that, sort of where, okay, first come, first serve. We've actually talked about that where, okay, if you want your kiddo at Everton in second grade, you need to get your kiddo registered. The problem with that is with transportation because we have parents who may not show up till the first day of school. We have parents, the school bus goes by, oh, time to go back to school. And I'm not being critical, I'm just saying that's the reality of it isn't it, Kim, that, you know, a lot of parents don't come in and register their kids early. So I, I get what you're saying. It would, it would prove to be a real burden on some of our most at-risk kids. But I, I understand that, you know. We, we've talked about that more than once. But the kids would be the ones who would suffer there, I'm afraid, too much. That's been our philosophy. So good question. Yes. Uh, where do we find the capacity numbers for each elementary school? How many I'm sorry. Sorry. Where do we find the capacity numbers on um, each elementary school? Like how many students can go to each elementary school? Oh, okay. Sorry, I couldn't. My head's. Um, I think it really looks at your building. So m not all of our buildings, uh, Jim talked about 900 square feet is sort of the, a 30 by 30 classroom. Some of our buildings don't have 30 by 30 classrooms that was built under a different standard. But you really look at the capacity of, for example, Eastview. Eastview is very full right now because they have, uh, in every grade level, they have two classes, so two first grades, or two kindergartens, but in first grade we have three this year because we had a large group of kiddos. Is it first grade? First grade. Yeah, I had to keep track. Or is it kindergarten? kindergarten. I'm looking ahead, sorry, to next year. Yeah, I'm already on next year. Yeah, we have three kindergarten, but we also have life skills in there. So that takes up the equivalent of two, of three classrooms. Fayette Central has a little more room. They have two classes per grade level for a total of 14 classes. And then, Kirsten, you're here, but you also have your specials classes and your other areas for uh, your resource rooms and things like that. So every building's not exact. So you, you really want to look at, we're basically a two section per grade building district with the exception of Eastview, which has three because we had a really large kindergarten group. Does that make sense? So you'd have to count all the classrooms that are not all exact because they're all different sizes. Everton is pretty full. So we did the, we, we used the idea of taking the gym because it was bigger than our standard in our other schools taking about a third of that and using it to create a library because that was one of our goals is to get that portable library out of there so kids wouldn't have to go out in the weather. So, you know, Everton, you don't, Brian, you don't have any extra space. And one of the challenges there was when Everton was built, we had half-day kindergarten. So he only had one kindergarten class with two half-day programs. And so the library, if I'm right, Brian, that was originally one of the other classrooms. So that's why the library ended up being placed in a portable classroom for all those years, because we needed two full-day kindergarten classes. So full-day kindergarten really changed the, the footprint of our buildings, because we needed more classrooms, too. So I'm not answering it well. Each building is specific to what room there is there, and they're not all the same. So that's a little tricky. but. We have, um, and we're careful about how much we put on there we, with our f uh, floor plans and things like that too. In this day and age, we always want to be careful how much information is out there accessible to the public for safety reasons. Leslie. Some of it's really tough because what we get into, like Eastview, is filled. 
So like, let's say their third grade is filled. So now we're taking those kids to Everton. A lot of times we'll find out Everton's second grade's full, so we gotta take him to Frazee. Their first grade's full, so we gotta take him to Fat Central. Their kindergartner's full, so we gotta take. So we're constantly running buses to other schools because of over full classrooms and to trying to get it even. So it makes it a little tougher. And then we just, our district is so spread out that we do have people on a bus for an hour, hour and 15 minutes. I mean, it's tough. We don't like it, but we don't have enough bus drivers either, that's for sure. So the transportation part's a real tough part of it, I think. Right. We have um, some classrooms, I'll give you an example, Everton, fourth grade, you have what, 15 kids per class, 15, 16? And we have another fourth grade. Mia, how many do you have in yours? Do you remember? Okay, so those are pretty good numbers, but we have other schools where we're having to close classrooms because what is that limit of how many fourth graders do we put in a class? So, the problem when you have five elementaries, and this is the same thing that happened with Orange and Alquina, you may have a group of kids come through that school and there may be 50 kids in third grade at Frazee, but then you may have 32 kids in the same grade at Everton or Grandview. That's, that's part of the challenge, and that's what Daryl was talking about we then get into this forced transfer piece where at some point we have to cap it. So let's say we hit 54 kids in a grade at fifth grade. That's 27 per class. We just keep letting one more in, one more in, eventually we're gonna have 30 per class. That's not good. So then if we add another teacher and we end up having 58 kids total in three classes, do the math on that, then it's, a, it's hard to fiscally maintain over time when you have discrepancies like that. Which really is why Gibraltar, I think, looked at if you have fewer schools, you have more capacity to balance classes. That was just an option they looked at. So it's never perfect and we agonize, I know in central office every year, we don't want to force transfer kids, but we have to cut it off at some point where we say, this is all we can accept in the fifth grade at Frazee. And then we look at the other schools, which they may have more capacity. So when you look at, remember what I said, our average class size is across the district when you take all the teachers and all the elementary kids, 21, that's a really good number. But we have outliers at each end where we have 27 at one end and we have 15 or 16 at the other. It's tough, it's a, it's, it's a real challenge and then that carries over to transportation and then it gets into that whole equity piece with what is equitable for kids? Is it okay for my kid to have 27 and my sister's child at Everton to have 15 or 16? That's, those are the challenges we face in trying to do what's best for the kids. It's hard. It's not. It's not easy. So somebody had a hand over here. We do a lot of shuttle buses now uh, because we run, remember we run buses for our, our seventh through 12th grade kids all over the county. And do any of your kids ride buses with the big kids and they, they, they transfer buses, the high school kids? That's pretty much the norm when you get into the, the outlying areas in the county. Daryl could speak more to that, but that's pretty accurate with how I did. So we're always gonna be running buses to town but there's nothing, if, we, if the board ever decides to have to close a school down the road, is the county school even the best option? I don't know. 
that, put, that presents other challenges with the youngest kids being on the bus even longer. So that's a real concern for me as superintendent. Do we want five and six year olds on that bus now having to come into town? That's, I mean, those are the, the, that's a dilemma that we're facing. It's nice having a couple of rural schools out there to be able to handle that. So that's, that's part of the challenge that we're faced with. How do we manage that? So, you know, transportation is, it's not a state mandate you have to provide busing. It's a service that school districts provide. And, you know, sometimes when parents are upset and say, well, my child's riding the bus too long, there's always that option to transport your child, but they, you know, transportation explains that it's going to be a little longer to accommodate you and right now we have enough bus drivers barely but our biggest struggle right now is we have 83 special need kids and I have three drivers that cover them and we may drop one off at 8 pick them up at 10 go back get another one at 10 30 drop them off at noon I mean it's constantly moving that part never stops and I mean so you never know what that bus driver is going to have from day to day because they'll move a kid or they'll call and say hey this class needs to be here we need to move him farther out let's let him stay an extra class so it's hard to put that puzzle together sometimes and just to understand that too when he talked about the kids with IEPs this, the kids who, who they don't all go to school at the same time. We may have some kids on reduced schedules, so I just want to be sure that was clear. We may have some students who only attend from 8 until 11.30. So those are the challenges that we're facing because there are certain bus specifications for kiddos too, and that, so that's what I just want to clarify, that you know we transport the kiddos, but it's really driven by their IEPs, their in individual educational plans, which are law when they're, when they're agreed to we support the kids through those. So that's the clarification. Ann? Um, I was uh, obviously aware that some school districts no longer bus kids 7 to 12 because they don't have enough bus drivers. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. And the one comment about the walk zone, who said that was, I would, not now publicly, but I would like to know because our, our, I just to clarify that, five blocks is what our walk zone is set up to be. And if someone's walking more than that, we, please ask them to contact Daryl because we aren't aware of that. Um, and we don't want the kids crossing busy intersections and things like that. So. If you recall, if you were here years ago, we used to have kids crossing over on Park Road. Mrs. Carlisle was the, the lady who escorted them across, but we really look at our boundaries to make sure the kids aren't walking too far, and five blocks is our standard. So if somebody is walking, please let us know, because that's troubling to me, because that's not something, and maybe they've been misinformed, or so let it, if you'll let Daryl know afterwards, that'd be great.
All righty, thank you. Did, yes. So back to the sports facility pieces, uh, they looked at everything, yes. And so when you look at improvements to a baseball field or a football field, those all come out of that same uh, operations fund unless you take out like a bond or some other type of, of loan, I guess. So yes, the education fund dollars that comes from state revenue, those can't be spent specifically on that. Is that. Did that answer your question? Okay, I, I, I didn't hear all of that the first time. Yeah, they looked at everything. For example, the pool. The pool needs some significant work. Pools cost a lot of money. So that's more information the board and the administration we're looking at is what can be done because 
I don't think any, most people in the community would say we shut the pool down and fill it in and not have a pool at the high school. So that's going to be something out of these funds that we have to look at as well. The pool needs some work. So yes, there would be some. There are some other areas that are in really good shape. Um, we also budget some money out of our operations funds to take care of regular work. And the athletic department also helps fund those because primarily football and basketball, they bring in the most revenue. And so those help pay for the equipment and some of the updates as well. So it's more than just the operations fund. But yes, that's all being considered when they looked at our whole campus. They looked at the career center. They looked at the administration building. And so every, the transportation department, every facility in our district was examined and looked at closely. Okay, I get what you, if we take this, did you all hear her back there? So she was talking about, we've, we've eliminated teaching spots through attrition over the years. Remember the 93, when Orange and Alquina closed, now 72. So her question was, if we close a building and let's say ship those kids to the other schools, sort of what we did with Maplewood. That's what we did, we shifted boundaries to try to get each building, 300 students per building was our goal when we, when we moved from six elementaries to five. So when we look at this moment in time, our class sizes are good on, across the district, but we still have kids where there's 15 or 16, the kids with 27. This is only going to compound and get worse. We have to look. This is sort of that planning you were referencing, not force, no foresight or planning. This is trying to look ahead to the next five to 10 years, where are we going to be? And so the, the inequities and the gaps are gonna continue at, because our birth rates aren't there in the county as they once were. The properties aren't available out in Everton and Fayette Central, that's part of the challenge. Families that are buying the, the properties don't have school-aged kids that attend our schools. If you follow the real estate market, especially out in Everton, it's happening a lot with people who don't send kids to school buying the properties. So that's our challenge there is how do we find, you know, right now Everton runs all the way in past the triangle, if you know where that is, almost the new, uh, the, the bypass, the new pavies, where else do we, take the boundaries for Everton. So those are just the challenges we face. The next place would be for us to move um, 
Hanson Meadows and Village Creek out to Everton. And I think there would be a lot of parents who wouldn't like their kids being bused out to Everton. <laughs> but I mean, those are the things that we look at to try to keep Everton full. That, so those are the challenges. It, it's, it's, a, it's a chessboard every year that we try to figure out where to, where to balance our classes the best we can. Ultimately, it takes its toll on our transportation part, and we're having to bus kids longer. So I don't have the answer. I just know every year we're faced with the same challenges, and we're going to continue to see it compound. Just a second. You had your hand up, sir. When we, when we repurpose Maplewood, and, and somebody brought up the uh, $1 purchase of a building, charter schools, the, the issue I have with charter schools, I don't want to make this political, is I don't have an issue with them if they were held to the same standard that public schools were. That's really the basis for me. When we have a student walk into our building, whether they have a special need or other, other challenge, we enroll all kids and take all kids. Those schools aren't held to that same standard. And so they cherry pick who they really want. And it, that's a whole another piece of it. And parents have the right to send their kids wherever. But that's the issue at the state level with the funding and how much money the state just pushed to charter school and vouchers. That's the, that's the real piece there. Um, back to your question. We, when we redistricted, thank you, sorry, I'm a little tired. Our goal was 300 students per school. And we, on paper, our director of technology ran the map and we had a place for every child in Fayette County by grade level color coded. And we were at 300 kids per school. Brian, I think you're about 265. And that happened by expanding their, their territory up to 44, which we then encompassed a large neighborhood on south of 44 and Pleasant View. But then a lot of those parents chose to continue. Kirsten, you have a lot of those parents who choose to drive their kids there. So that further imbalanced that because parents wanted to keep their kids in their school. So we didn't foresee that that many kids would not. So yes, Everton, is about 30 to 50 kids less than what we had expected at this point. Whereas Fayette Central is above 300. And so, you know, but there was capacity there for those kids to go back there. Does that make sense? So when we moved the boundaries to 30th Street and Offutt's Park, we were trying to move enough kids out to Fayette Central because we were really trying to move enough kids out to Everton. And when the only place we had to go to grab the kids at Everton was going north and west out to Glenwood. So everything affects everything when you look at boundaries. That makes sense. So poor Mr. Jennings back here, you know, he's, he's wanting these kids to come out there, but there just aren't enough kids in the bottom half of the county. So it's now a never-ending process. Do we redistrict every three years to try to get to that 300? Right now, we are barely at 300 per school when you look at 1,500 kids divided by five. Hope that's not confusing. So if we lose 30 elementary kids next year, it continues to be a factor. And then our high school, we have about 950 kids at our high school now. When Alquina and Orange closed, we had over 1,200. Middle school had about 625. Now they're at 500, is that right, Dr. Todd? So it's, it's just a domino piece there. So I, I apologize if this is a day one question. I'm sure that No, we have five total. Yeah. Out of curiosity, uh, why not have one city elementary school that can take over that workload, where it's one building that we're maintaining there, and then we'll sort out the outlying populace and, and all that later on. But we can get everybody in under one roof here, one area for all of us to drive to, one thing to maintain, only one building that we're doing maintenance on in the city instead of all the other ones that are. It's all 
still the same teacher, it's all still the same students, and it's all within the same tribe. I assume that conversation's happened before the board said not going to happen, probably money, and that would be a simple answer to it. But what, I mean, I know that conversation happened with half of the it, ha it has sort of happened. Um, when Gibraltar put together the ideas, you know, they were looking at five school configuration, keeping them all and remodeling all. Uh, I think a four school, a three school, a two school. And I think, you know, that came up in one of our, I think one of our board members even mentioned, what if we built the one big school? So yes, those have been discussed and I think everything's on the table with, I mean, they work at our pleasure with what we're really looking at. So we can put numbers to everything. So I don't, I don't think anything like that's, I, would, I don't want to speak for the board, but I think they're going to consider every viable option. Right. Right. When we give them more direction on where we want to go with ideas, they've started putting together some preliminary numbers. Um, I mean, they could throw out ballpark figures, a new elementary with 750 students, they could tell you within a couple million dollars, probably of what, 30 million, 35 million? I mean, a ballpark number, they could give us numbers all day and all night tonight, but we need to look at what are the things we're going to do at each building, and that's, so this really, I want to preface it, they could have gone through 72 slides and spent four hours, but it's, it's a readability factor, we didn't know how many folks would come. We want people to go home, look at this information where it's readable on your computer, take the time to do that, along with all the other things. So there will be more meetings to look at this, and I think the next step, we have a work session next Wednesday night with the board. It's a public work session. It will be in the boardroom at the administration building. I assume, Justin, it will be televised as well. So Justin enjoys these meetings. But, um, <laughs> but I think that, uh, you know, watch the information online. TV3 does a great job of televising all of our uh, meetings. So. To answer your question, I think once we're giving them more direction on where we're going to go, right now it's still more sharing information, trying to be transparent with the public on what, where we're at. Well, we will have that information. Not yet, but that's, that's, those are the next steps that are coming, yes. Right, when will the public have that information? When the board receives that information. They haven't gotten it yet.
but even they said they they still had work to do. So this is this was not meant to be premature and frustrate people by coming to you without all the information. It was to bring you along on the process. We've been trying to publicize it through social media, through the newspaper, and it's done a great job. To invite you to our special work session. I realize it's not exciting, um, but if you want to know more, it, I mean, we're still processing. Every one of us is in a different place with, oh my gosh, I mean, I the last work session. Thank you, Leslie. And that was with Gibraltar, they were just, they work in other communities. Um, Logan's Ports one, I believe, just, you, you want to speak to that? Thank you. 
Commissioner said that when the commission is sent out that time with no explanation or anything, it makes people even more questions because they never had a chance to look and see the presentation. They just get information thrown at them in the public. And so what we're trying to do is present it in a way that most communities want, which is present, make it available, present again, make it available. And it's just to keep doing that process until the right answer is seen. In all the presentations, I heard someone say, yeah, they're all, everything we've done with learning environments and electricity and everything, it's all online in the world. Thank you, Jim. So this presentation will be online too tomorrow with the others, but you can go there and find the information. Um, because the learning environment was a big piece of that study as well. We missed it. Is there anything else? Patty. Oh, a time I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you very well. Ultimately, the school board will make the final determination. That is, that falls under their jurisdiction as the elected officials representing Fayette County Schools. Um, there's still a lot of work to do, Patty, though, with that. So they need to get, as they share more information with the board, you know, one of the board, Chris, Mr. Hunt may say, you know, hey, let's look at this option. And, you know, and the board will discuss that in public. Our business is conducted in public. So you can go to TV3 and watch the archives of the, of the meetings. I would encourage you to do that if you would like. So there is no specific timeline as far as when. There are certain timelines, though, when we look at funding and the bonds and things that are required by state statute that we have to follow. So we are under that obligation to follow what Indiana Code requires with the timelines. Right now, you can see we don't have any consensus with what we're doing. It, this is still very much the exploratory stage. But when, when that does happen, it will be in a public meeting as all the business is conducted. Does that answer your question well enough? Okay. I want to commend our young people who are here. I think we lost one back here, didn't we? So any adults did we lose? But back here too, the Nobbies. Thank you. That's, that's pretty impressive for almost two and a half hours to sit here and listen to some exciting adults talk about exciting topics like this. But, you know, they are our future. And I grew up here. This is my home. And any decision, you know, and I know every one of our board members are invested in this community. And our team here is invested, and as you are. And so whatever happens, you know, we don't have that crystal ball where we're going to know what may happen in Fayette County. I hope we land some employers. I hope we grow. We don't know that, but our, you know, I believe that we have a board that's going to always keep at the forefront the kids. And I say that with 100% confidence. So, you know, it's a big task. And I say just bear with us, stay with us. We will be getting to those numbers. That's what they're for. We're just not ready yet. So I think next week's Wednesday at 6 p.m., the 24th, 
It will be streamed, I'm guessing, too, so you can watch it from home. You're welcome to come to the boardroom at the administration building, 1401 Spartan Drive, out on the high school campus. So unless there's anything else, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up, and I want to say thank you for coming out and being active participants, and I hope we have more folks at the next one. So thank you, and have a good evening.